Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Well, stand up as we pray together. I know many of you must be tired. Having such a busy and busy day. But you want to commit yourself to the Lord. That the Lord will give you the strength. To still keep awake. And receive the totality of the word. The Lord is sending to you. Would you please open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord will help you, give you the mind, the mind of Christ. The heart that is new. And the hand that stays on the word of God. Wanting to receive everything the Lord wants to give. And the courage, the conviction. The hard decision to stand by the word and to live by the word, the Lord will give unto you so that we have a courageous team of preachers, pastors, overseers, leaders, coordinators, group coordinators, women leaders, women coordinators, youth leaders, children, church leaders. That in every area of work will be bold for the truth. Courageous for righteousness. Having conviction. I mean able to stand on that conviction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege once again to come before the extray of your word. We ask you, O know, Lord, that you reveal your mind, your truth to every one of us, and then you'll give us the boldness, the conviction of character to be able to carry out to do what you're calling us to do. Great work. At difficult times, even in dangerous places, that Lord, everything we need, you grant unto us. And this work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. We can see now. We come to Titus chapter 1. I want to remind you that Titus was put or left in Crete because he had an assignment in verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5, for this cause, for this reason, for this purpose, I left thee in Crete that thou shouldest search in order the things that are wanting the things that are lacking the things that are misplaced the things that are disorganized and ordained elders in every city as I not as we as I Paul the apostle as I have ordained you as I've ordained thee. And then Paul the Apostle had spoken to Titus, reaching to Titus. Here are the qualifications to be looking for. As you choose people, you know, the process of selection. When you select some, you have to leave out others. The process of selection. When you bring in some, you have to leave out others. Bringing in people that doesn't take too much of courage, stamina, spiritual fortitude. What takes courage? 
is when you have to leave out some. When you have to disqualify others. Now Paul the apostle had told him, these are the people you take in. In that process of selection, you have to also buy, you have to silence, you have to stop, you have to disqualify, you have to disapprove of some others. This is the area of ministry for an overseer. For a pastor, for a leader, and those of us who are group coordinators and group coordinators in Lagos here, here is a challenge. And this year, I told them our reps already through the brother, I should say through the pastor that is uh, kind of coordinating all those reps. Lagos is very large, you understand, the population of Lagos. Apart from just church, the population of Lagos is uh, now beyond 13 million people. The population of Lagos City alone is much more higher than the population of many countries, not only in Africa, in the world. The very, is a great city, a major, a mega city. And then the membership of Deeper Life of the Church here in Lagos. The membership is so large that we just cannot divide into regions. But I already mentioned it to them that we're going to operate in a, diff in a different way this year. Because as some of our what we call old districts here, the membership is much, much larger than our membership in many nations of the world. Some of the, mem the membership of some of, our, some of our old district. You take the membership of a whole country. I think it will only be Ghana that is larger than some of our old districts. And some of these um, districts in Lagos they are much, much larger in membership, deeper life membership, than many states here in Nigeria. And because of that, already, um, you know, I've, you know, put down things. Uh, if you're going to see me in the states and in the countries uh, this year, you really have to pray because this year, we're, you know, I've lined up crusades for Lagos. And I'm handling those crusades in the old districts. And I'm going to take those old districts as states. And I'm going to, and already I'm putting some authority in their hands. I'm not looking at them anymore like coordinator, like group coordinator. I'm telling you my mind. I'm looking at them, some of them, as state overseers. I need them here in Lagos. That's why we have not transferred them. I could have taken any of them, taking them to any of the countries. What they're doing here, the challenge is so great. And so, coordinators and group coordinators, you know, I you know, just call you that. You're real pastors. Now, in Lagos, you're going to have to choose Choose leaders and choose workers. And here is a difficult assignment. When you take in some, you have to disqualify others. And you know, it's not kind of state when, you know, the person is local government there and he doesn't see the face of the state of us here except when they come for retreat. You're living in that same vicinity community and he'll see you every time and you've disqualified this and disqualified this and removed this and then you brought in this and you see one another every time. Leaders, get ready. For the frowning of the people. And get ready. For negative attitude. Negative reaction. And that is what we're built for. That we should be able to endure the heat. Endure the contradiction. Endure the reaction of the people. Because you will choose some. And you will disqualify Others, you look at Titus chapter 1, 
I'm reading from verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. Think about that. That there are people, you cannot choose them. You cannot put them into the ministry whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, and the Grecians are always said the Grecians are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. The, the trend of the world and the trend of the younger generation, now you need to understand if you study you know, the, the social kind of presentation of, of the communities in the, in the 60s. And there was, you know, something in vogue over here in the country. Then in the 70s, you know, things change. In the 80s, things change. In the 90s and now, in the first decade of this 21st century, things are changing. And the culture of insubordination is now reigning rampant all over the world. It's a new thing. And yet, you understand, as the culture of countries and mega cities are changing from this to that, the church remains the same. And so it says, you rebuke them sharply. You might say, this is not the age to do that. This is not the time to do that. The culture does not permit for that to be done. We're not waiting for the permission of the culture. We already have a permit authority from on high, from heaven. And when you have a higher authority and you have a higher permission, a greater authority that comes and he says, here is how to carry on the work of the Lord. Them that sin and them that bring any other sin apart from this unchanging, eternal, infallible word, it says, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. That's the reason why if we ever rebuke anybody, if we ever correct anybody, is that they may be sound in the faith. Not given heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. But in works, in performance, in practical demonstration, in their lifestyle, in the visible fruit, that we see in their works, they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. One of the responsibilities of Titus as a pastor and as an overseer in Crete was to distinguish between those who are commissioned as saints of God. And those who are condemned and not sent by God as a leader in the church. Ordained for the approval of the godly. And ordained for the disapproval of the ungodly. Titus must, number one, be committed to the truth. That's number one. You don't want to play favoritism. 
You want you don't want to appreciate anybody beyond the word is eternal saving truth. You don't want to become so sentimental, so loving, so sensual, sentimental, sensual, but not sensual in the negative way. That you hold somebody so important and you have affection for anybody beyond the truth. Titus, here is your responsibility in your life. Whether you have friends or you don't have friends. Whether you have people who appreciate you or not. Whether they murmur, grumble against you or not. Here is the number one commodity you have. The truth. Hold on to it. And then not only that, you must have the mind of Christ. And you must know Titus the scripture. And also be full of the Holy Ghost. And you must approve the true ministers and then remove, remove, remove the false ministers. Titus, you must not be governed by deceptive outward appearances. But you must see what the eyes of God. Such a leader charged with such great responsibility must walk very close to God. So as to maintain the conviction and the courage that is necessary for his divinely appointed task. I want you to think about this with me now. Moses was going to the mountain top. And he handed over the ministry, the work, the administration, the counseling, the encouragement, the preaching, the exhortation. He handed over everything to Aaron. How many days did Aaron spend on the mountain? So Moses on the mountain? How many days? 40 days, less than two months, the whole nation backslid before he came back. Just imagine now, if God had chosen Aaron to lead that whole nation for 40 years. The kind of people we choose, and you hand over things to, and some of us, uh, uh, brothers, uh, leaders, overseers, you're going to visit another nation on short term, a short term outreach because your state, your place, you're adopting that nation. And then you hand over that state or headquarters to somebody. And in this time, you want to really do solid work in that other country. And you're spending about three weeks or four weeks. I say, there can be no harm, brother. You take over. You better make your choice very well. Not everybody can hold that stage before you come back. You might discover that some things that happened. That everything you built up. And you might have fasted for 40 days. And then you are there on the mountain. Then you hand over onto an Aaron. And before you come back, everything is totally destroyed. You have to go back on your face again and be praying, Oh Lord, don't destroy these people. Accept them that they're still your inheritance. And so... If he could not hold that nation for 40 days, how then you understand why we have to disqualify some people? Why we choose this and when we reject that? Even wise Solomon, wise Solomon, look at the work his father built up. There was a day that his father David went to the battlefield he was getting old about 70 years of age getting to 70 not, not quite 70 years and then the Philistines came and one of the people wanted to just get rid of David and then one of the valiant men of David got rid of that other person then the people said David you will not go to a battle with us again because you are the light of the nation
And if the light of the nation is quenched, where will we be? And think about the cost and think about the sacrifice. It took David to build up a nation like that. He took the wrecks and the ruins of the nation from Saul. Saul didn't do anything. He didn't fight the battles of the Lord. He was only fighting his personal battle. And then the nation was about wrecked and ruined when David took over. And David just reorganized everything, set everything in order, put everything in place. And now before he went, he handed over to Solomon. Think about that nation in the hands of Solomon. Wise man, wise man. But you know the people after he died, he came to his son. He said, your father made our yoke heavy. Every, they always remember the days of David. But then he said, Solomon, see what he has done. He used his wisdom, ruined that nation. And God said, I cannot leave the whole nation in his hand. I'll give him only two tribes out of 12. And I'm going to give 10 to a servant. Think about that. That's the reason why in leadership, there is the choice of who to do this, who to do that. And we have to disapprove of some. Just say, you cannot do it. But they are wise, like Solomon. Yes, we have to be careful. But they are the senior brother to Moses. Aaron, you have to be very careful. In making our choice. And that's the reason why we come to this session now. I'm talking to you on this divinely appointed duty towards reprobates. The divinely appointed duty towards reprobates. We're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, recognition, the recognition of deceptive preachers. The recognition of deceptive preachers. Number two, Repudiation, the repudiation, rejection of disqualified pastors. The repudiation, that means just the rejection. Push them away, renounce them, get rid of them, remove them. The repudiation of disqualified pastors. Number three, the rejection of defiled professors. They profess to know God, but in work, they deny him. The rejection of defiled Professors, number one, the recognition of deceptive preachers. We're looking at Titus chapter one, verse ten. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Here, Paul, the apostle, said, "Titus, I've been in Crete. I was there with you." I left you there, but I observed the people, I saw the people, I evaluated their lives, and I gauged their commitment. There are many vain talkers, unruly talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. The Jewish religious people had found their way into Crete. And they were about to exalt circumcision above the crucifixion of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he said, they are there. And I didn't have time to do all that. That's why I left you there to set everything in order. And you need to take those people on. Do something about them. There were deceivers in Crete. These false deceptive preachers were unruly and vain talkers. The average member in the congregation could not recognize them. Neither could they disapprove of them. Before the coming of Titus as the pastor there, before the coming of Titus as the teacher, the leader, the overseer there, they had done a great damage. They were so clever and crafty. That's one of the things that you'll find. So clever, so crafty. That it will take you to have some insight. In what eyes. Before you can see the deception. The craft. The cleverness. But the average person in Crete could not recognize that. And then they, they had exercised such authority, manifested such influence, they subverted whole houses. 
their work. They were destroying and demolishing why the preachers of the gospel were building up, subverting houses. That just means that they were destroying the faith of Christian families. Not only that, they were teaching things contrary to the truth. And that's what you read in Titus chapter 1. They were teaching things they ought not. you find that in verse 11. And it's because of filthy lucre. That's because of covetousness. Because their belly was their God. It says... The belly is just to feed their covetousness. That's why they did what they did. They trained themselves to teach lies as religious professional liars. And they became evil bees. They became so recognized in their lies that were told in uh, verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet, a poet actually, of their own said, The Grecians are always liars. Became a culture of them. Evil beasts and slow bellies. They entered into the churches not to bless, but to make the church to bleed. They entered into the churches not to develop them, to destroy them, and to damn the souls of the members. Their deception, exalting the commandments of men above the, above the word of God, God's transforming truths. Was already turning many away from the truth. You'll find that in that Titus chapter 1. Verse 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. These deceivers were not only deceiving others. They were defiled. They were abominable. They were disobedient. Their mind and their conscience became hardened. Seared defiled they became reprobates yet the church could not recognize or discern their deception or defining influence can you think about that they were doing so much so much evil and the evil they were doing was not even underground anymore because they were subverting christian families and destroying the faith, overthrowing the faith of those people. It wasn't anything secret anymore. And yet the church could not recognize that these were evil people wanting to take the people on their way to heaven. Bring them back on the broad way that leads to hell. And so Paul the apostle said, you know, Titus, I would have been there myself. Just, 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 just change my residency and just change my location of ministry. But Titus, I put everything I have, I put everything in you. And I know that we're walking in the same step. And we're walking by the same spirit. Therefore, Titus, that's why I'm leaving you there by the way. Why didn't Paul the Apostle send Timothy to Crete and send Crete unto Ephesus? Have you thought about that? You know, in Ephesus where Timothy was, the only problem, the only challenge is that uh, Ephesus was a kind of a long-standing church. And there were many members of that church, old in age. And Timothy, when he came to the congregation, they were not even intimidating. They were not posing any problem to him. Just their age, not just their stature. He became timid. The Paul, the apostle had to say, Timothy, wake up. I sent you there that you may charge those people not to teach any other doctrine. And they're not even posing any danger unto you. Just because they're older than you. And you think about a youthful stamina. And it says, do not let anybody despise you because of your youth. He was in the 30s. And then he said, God has not given you Timothy a spirit of fear. 
Wake up. Stir up the gift in you. He couldn't send Timothy to Crete, but Titus, he could send Timothy, he could send Titus to Crete, you know. And some people are qualified. Some people, they are, they are up to it and they can do the work. As for preaching, they can preach. As for knowing the truth, they know the truth. As for being able to direct people to the way of salvation, they can, like Timothy. But there are some places you cannot send them. Some places you cannot send them. And you have to, you have to look at that place, look at the situation. Look at the peculiarities there and look at the challenges there. Look at the, uh, the kind of the danger and the difficulty and the challenge and the toughness of that environment. Look at all the people there and then you're making all your selections. You know Timothy can't do that. And so he said, Titus, I'm sending you there and you're going to do some work to set things in order. That's why you're there. And you know, to do this, uh, you, you really have to have the courage and the stamina, the conviction to be able to stand your ground. And yet, the church there could not discern. They couldn't see the deception, the defining influence. Titus would have to possess sound spiritual eyes to see into what the members of the church could not see. I'm sure you know there are, you know, medical doctors. And medical doctors are not just to prescribe medicine. They are not just to, you know, give us injection and, and treat us and hospitalize us. The medical doctors must be well trained to diagnose deadly contagious diseases. Medical doctors must be well trained to diagnose deadly contagious diseases whose symptoms are not obvious and the same thing with the leadership in the church there are some things that you'll find in the lives of people very very dis uh, contagious and it will spread and it's a spiritual disease but the average man that is not trained will not know the impact of such Contagious spiritual disease. That's why the doctors are there. They specialize. And that's why the pastors, the overseers are there. We specialize. And we're able to see, wait, if this trend continues, it's just a matter of years. This church will not be a holiness church. The pastor, the overseer, has to discern what other people cannot discern. If this culture continues, this church will not be able to stand in experience, in manifestation, will not be able to stand on sanctification. You might have it on paper, might have it in the head. Will not be able to stand on sanctification. And the pastor, the overseer in the region, in the state, in the nation must discern that before it becomes a kind of disease that nobody can cure anymore. Doctors will know that those diseases, if they are not attended to immediately, you know, they, they, they will just die. And you know, some of these uh, diseases, they don't have any kind of painful sign. And those people, that's why you hear of some people, I saw him last week. I saw him last month. He was so alive from vigor, running and jumping. How is it that I heard that he died just about two days ago? How could that happen? He had a disease. He himself could not find out. And that disease did not have a painful symptom, any painful symptom. And because of that, he said, I'm all right. The church is like that. There may be some diseases that do not carry with them painful symptoms. And before, because we don't feel the pain, we don't know it's disease. And therefore, we're just going on. It takes a doctor, well-trained doctor. To discover that the disease, point it out and give the solution and the treatment immediately. It takes a well-trained overseer, pastor, district coordinator. And it takes a, a well-trained, sharp-sighted, a group coordinator in our headquarters church here to see 
this is a disease. It must be cured. It will be cured. I said it will be cured. Church leaders must be so well taught and so well trained that we become so skillful in the word of righteousness and have our spiritual senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Only then will each be able to take heed to the ministry which he has received in the Lord to fulfill that ministry. Having diagnosed the disease, the, do the doctor must treat the patient, must heal, deliver that patient before it becomes too late. Having discerned the deception and discovered the deceivers, titles, as well as those of us who are here, contemporary church leaders must deal with the situation and deliver the church from going down the drain. Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise, shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, will endure to the end. In verse 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We're looking at 1 John chapter 4 verse 1. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try, test, examine, evaluate the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. By the way, this is uh, the apostle of love, John. Saying, believe not every preacher, every spirit, every prophet. Try them, test them, examine them, evaluate them. But try the spirits, whether they have God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. In Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 1, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. There were in the past, in the old covenant, in the old testament. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. Did you see how the apostles, they went from the old and they came to the new. They said, this was the situation in the time of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. In the time of old, there were false prophets among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves sweet destruction. That's what they want to bring on the church. They want to bring speedy destruction on the church. But they'll be bringing upon themselves swift destruction, speedy destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Can you imagine that? You know, there are some of us that feel we don't need, you know, that vigilance in our church. We have taught the word of God so well. We have taught the word of God line upon line, precept upon precept. Who can deceive anybody in deep and lie? They know it from cover to cover. And, you know, many of our members, they've been attending the Monday Bible study for years. Who can deceive them? That's what you think. But you see, these people, they were the people taught by the apostles that Jesus trained. And even though it was Jesus himself, 
that trained these apostles and these churches in the first century, these churches came out of the ministry of those first early apostles. Yet it's still said that those false prophets, they'll have a measure of success. And it says in that verse, too many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Now you have three categories of people now. Number one, the true church. Number two, the people who have been called, who have been taken out by the false teaching out of the true church and they become a deceived church going on their way to damnation and then you have the people of the world the true church holding on to the truth the people who had been deceived and they have been brought out of the true church now they are in this middle they are neither there totally in the true church nor totally in the world but their lifestyle will make the third group the people of the world to be speaking evil of the true way of the Lord. And that's what happens. That's the reason the Lord was telling Titus, recognize the deceivers, deceptive preachers. And that's the reason why the Lord is telling us, recognize them. We cannot just, all we need is evangelism. Just, just do this and do this and then if we want to gather the crowd and gather the people together, we must forget about looking at clever, crafty deceivers. No, we cannot forget because if you forget, you'll just be wasting your time. You'll get them into the kingdom and all these people be giving them their literature their erroneous uh, doctrine and everything and then they empty the true church and then they have these people they're still church but they have nothing of the truth many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with faint words make merchandise of you make merchandise of the people the deceivers judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnations lumbereth not but we all stand we're going to stand on the truth and uh, the lord is going to support is going to back up the people that stand on the truth and we're going to win the day in jesus name now we come to point number two, the repudiation of disqualified pastors. We're coming to Titus chapter, ch chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. We're reading from verse 11. Whose mouths must be stopped. How do you stop the mouth of a lion? Dangerous work. How do you stop the mouths of wolves whose nature is the nature of the wolf? Dangerous, dangerous work. How do you stop the mouth of somebody who doesn't care for love, for affection, doesn't appreciate tenderness, doesn't know grace, and what he intends to do, the evil, to destroy the people of God, that's what is bent on doing. And he doesn't care for any message. Whatever works is what he will do. How do you stop their mouth? And yet you still have to. And it says, whose mouth must be stopped. How do you stop somebody who will go all over town and mention your name and spoil your name and destroy you? And if you're looking for reputation and the respect of the public, your reputation is gone. This, and they're so crafty and they're so deceptive and they know how to turn the minds of people. And you are not there to defend yourself. Even if you were there to defend yourself, the people they are talking to, they don't have any appreciation, any value. They don't place any prize on these eternal truths. 
and they're going to condemn you behind you unto your face when these crafty people when they go to talk to them and yet this is the assignment you have whose mouths must be stopped you put your reputation on the line you just have to behave like our mentor not just my mentor is the mentor of the whole church deep alive john wesley when they told him and they said see your reputation is going oh he says i have no reputation when i gave my life to the lord i gave reputation i gave it to the lord john wesley is the mentor of this church and whatever other preacher you listen to, apart from those of us, apart from our ministers, our leaders, our overseers, whatever the leaders you listen to, I mean, among those who have gone, those who are dead, John Wesley will be number one on our list. One day he was coming from the field, that is evangelistic field. His house was on fire, burnt. And somebody ran to him and said, Wesley, Wesley, your house is on fire. Say, which house? I have no house. Everything belongs to the Lord. And if the Lord decides to burn down his house, then he gives me liberty and freedom. I don't have to care now for anything because now there's nothing that will take my attention. Thank God the house is gone. That's John Wesley. At the age of 86, John Wesley, he, he was, you know, talking to a friend, and this was a complaint he had. He said, I realize now, age of 86, I'm getting old now. I cannot preach more than two messages every day anymore. He used to preach three, four a day. But now at the age of 86, he said, my only regret, I see that old age is coming. I cannot preach more than two messages a day anymore. At the age of 88, he was, you know, talking to another person. He said, you know what? This old age, now I realize what they call the old age. I cannot wake up earlier than 5 a.m. You know, I just, I, I, you'll go to sleep about 10 o'clock. You know, that's what they call the Methodist, the Methodical. And he said, you know, I now see that I'm getting old. And, you know, I, I, he used to wake up at 4 and then, you know, pray and read the Bible and just study and then get prepared, get on the horse and then move from place to place. And he said, now 88 years of age, I cannot wake up before 5 a.m. Those are people that served the Lord. And those people, they really, they really did everything the way it should be done. And that's what we're passing across to you. That in our young age, we can still do something. We will do something. Titus chapter 1, in verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert houses, teaching things they ought not. For feel the Lucas sake, one of themselves, even a prophet, a poet of their own said. The Grecians are always liars, evil bees, low bellies. These witnesses true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the face, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Let's see how some worthies of old, how they did it. Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 27. Nehemiah 13 verse 27. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil? To transgress against our God in marrying strange wives and one of the sons of Jehoiada. The son of Elisha. The high priest was son in law to Shambalat and the, Hor the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. That's Nehemiah. The spirit that will not accept any person that takes a false step into the ministry. He said, I chased him from me. Remember them, oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood. 
Nehemiah said, you see, I'm only building walls. I'm doing more than that. I'm purging the priesthood. And I'm taking away from the priesthood the people that ought not to be there. He said they had defiled the priesthood. And then he tells us in that, in that place. And then he says, the covenant and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers. And I appointed wards of the priests and of the Levites, everyone in his business. The Lord wants us to do that in Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16. Second Chronicles chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 16. Here it says, and also concerning Mecca, the mother of Asa the king. The mother of Asa the king. He removed her from being queen. That's the mother. And the mother had been queen because he was, you know, he was king and, you know, the uh, father had died. That's why the authority not to rule came to him, but the mother was still alive. And he still gave the respect of queen to the mother because she had been queen when the husband was alive. But now Asa, wanting to purge, wanting to purify the country, the nation, removed the mother from being queen. Why? He removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in a groom. And Asa caught down her idol and stamped it and burnt it at the brook Kidron. Can you be that firm? Of course you will be. I said you will be. Hosea chapter 4. We're reading from verse 6. Hosea chapter 4. Reading from verse 6. Hosea 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also have rejected thee, that thou should be no priest to me. Anyone who rejects the doctrine, the teaching, we must repudiate. We must reject. To repudiate means to disown. It means to disapprove. It means to disclaim. It means to deny, renounce, reject. Preachers who teach error and falsehood. Preachers who overthrow the faith of believers. Preachers who teach lies against God and they confuse men concerning the way of salvation. They're dangerous enemies of the never dying souls of men. The mouth of false prophets and false teachers is a devastating force for evil. They cause immeasurable damage. Sometimes, not only immeasurable damage, irreparable repairable damage that before we eventually come I will want to set things right the people have gone beyond the time the day the possibility of restoration their mouth must be stopped it may not be easy to stop the mouths of wolves and wild dogs and vipers but this is an assignment a leader cannot, cannot avoid. It is better for a leader to suffer persecution temporarily than to allow multitudes of souls to be deceived and damned than to suffer eternal punishment in hell. It is the duty, the responsibility of divinely appointed leaders who are committed to the truth to silence preachers under their leadership who pervert God. God's truth who corrupt God's people. You cannot stop all the you know preachers of error in the continent of Africa or in Europe or in the United States of America. You cannot stop everybody, but those ones under your own leadership, your own authority, they're under your nose, you're under your watching eyes. And just before you there, if they perpetrate any error, if you don't stop them, you're a coward. You're a compromiser. 
and you care for your honor more than you care for the salvation of souls. And that the people are going to suffer if they are lost. They are going to suffer in eternity. That does not matter to you. You don't want to suffer. Just a temporary, temporal kind of affliction. But if you count the souls of the people, very important. You don't mind the suffering. The assignments the Lord has given you to stop the mouths of those vain, unruly talkers and deceivers. You still have to do it. Leaders are to discipline and stop the preachers who sin. The preachers who cover up sin. The preachers under your leadership who compromise and encourage sinning. And once again, you know, a state of a say, I'm sure you know this already. I'm just saying it for the benefit of your people who are here. You don't have to get in touch with me. When you find that somebody under your leadership commits sin, before you discipline, I'm sure you know that. I just want your people to know. And if chief NEP, anybody under your leadership is incorrigible, unteachable, becomes an heretic, and is perpetrating another sin, something that shouldn't be. He calls himself a member of the prayer warriors. And then you hear that strange fire is coming in. He might say, I've not come here adultery, I've not committed fornication. And uh, you know, you are the state of Asia, the region of Asia, there, the, the national of Asia that you, you, you deal with. That you don't have to, you don't have to, even have to call me. That's your responsibility. Titus did not have to call Paul and say, Paul, I see, I need you to do just go ahead and do it. And then I told you already, group coordinators in Lagos and coordinators. I accept you as, you know, state of affairs. The work you do is so significant and we're adjusting things in Lagos. If somebody does and is in evil, you don't have to wait for me for your combined service and say, I need to see the pastor on this. This is what so-and-so has done. Uh, pastor, will you stop him? No, you are there, pastor there. You are the overseer there, group coordinators and coordinators. Coordinators, just inform your group coordinator and then we we'll have reps now. Just go ahead and deal with it. Deal with the situation. We're working together. And not worry what they'll write to me. They'll write a lot of things, a lot of letters to me. I'm expecting they're going to write some quite, uh, you know, voluminous letters to me this year because, you know, you're going to do your work and some of those people, they'll think they're going to use me to destroy your authority. Nobody will be able to do that. And so we need to understand that this is the work the Lord has committed into our hands and it will be done. We will not support error. We will not support falsehood. We're going to preach the word. We're going to stand upon this unchanging word. Godly leaders must know the truth. And be skillful in teaching the truth clearly, convincingly, and effectively to overpower false teachers by the truth and by sound doctrine. We must not be afraid of opposition, of false accusation, or name calling. That's what those false prophets, that's what they, uh, they, they specialize in. They'll call us names. Narrow-minded. He doesn't have love. He doesn't have appreciation. They'll call us names. Who cares? Don't worry about the name calling by those false prophets and their followers. We must revoke the right. And the privilege of false teachers to preach and to teach or to minister and to exercise any ministerial role. We cannot support false teachers or their spurious teaching in any way. If our single sole desire is to please the Lord who has ordained and established us in the ministry now listen to what the puritans and what they have said the puritans are those are church leaders that they were in the 16th in the 17th century that is to have a martin luther 16th century and then the crop of leaders they call them non-conformists the puritans here is what they have said 
uh, Thomas Watson said, arrow dams as well as vice. One, the one arrow is pistol and the other vice that is poison. It says arrow even kills faster than vice. And then Thomas Manton says, we should as carefully avoid error as vices. A blind eye is even worse than a lame foot. He said, yea, blind eyes may cause a lame foot. And then John Flavel, he said, by entertaining strange persons, men sometimes entertain angels unawares, but... By entertaining strange doctrines, many have entertained devils unawares. John Trapp said, pollution is the forerunner of perdition. Pollution is the forerunner of perdition. And then Thomas Manton again, the devil is called the prince of the power of the air. Infected air is drawn into the lungs without pain and we get a disease before we feel it another one said division is better than agreement in evil you know the people who are looking for unity at all costs they just want to be united be in fellowship and this uh, man george Hutchison said division is better division is better than agreement in evil and then John Owen, he said, Simeon and Levi never did worse than when they were united. He said, when they were apart, doing their own thing, we didn't hear about much evil when they came together. Simeon and Levi, they did the worst of all evils because they were united. Those were the people that just took the sword, deceived the shaky mites, and they said, circumcise yourself. We'll give you dying our sister. And they killed all of them. And then this, uh, this Walter crack dog. It says it's better to have division than an evil uniformity. That is why, you know, all these uh, people, uh, these, were, these were preachers before us. And these were people that stood on the truth. It is now our time. They have gone. We are still alive. It's this, our time. And we will do right in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. amen. I come to point number three now. The rejection of defiled professors. The rejection of defiled professors. Titus chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. Titus chapter 1, verse 15 and verse 16. Unto the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their minds and conscience is defiled. They profess to know God. They make a loud noise. They know God. They profess that they know God. But in words, in behavior, in character, in performance, in activity, they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobates. The false prophets, the false teachers, they do not only subvert houses and families they also pervert themselves they become perverts those false prophets and false teachers they are not only deceivers they are deceived and they're deluded those false prophets and false teachers they are not only vain talkers and teachers they are vile transgressors those false prophets and false teachers, they are not merely liars, but they are like, also licentious. They do not stop at turning others from the truth. They themselves have turned away from the truth. Their conscience is defiled. Their lives are abominable. Their character disobedient. Their profession empty and worthless. By their works, they deny God. And God will deny them on earth and throughout eternity. 
false prophets and false teachers continue in error and in falsehood until they internally believe that evil is good and good is evil they actually believe it they actually believe it as you listen to you know our brother our minister who taught um, on literature and then he mentioned uh, those people that published literature and then they put error for truth they actually believe that in their heart they have brainwashed themselves and they zealously contend that darkness is light and that light is darkness they will justify the evil way they propose they propagate they have brainwashed and convinced themselves that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter and they eventually become reprobates and they zealously run after error they have rejected the saving truth the lord has rejected them too they have ruined themselves they must not be allowed to ruin innocent ignorant souls that's why we have to stop them that's why we have to gag them that's why we have to muzzle their mouth so that they do not have any chance any privilege to damn the souls of men in the passage i read to you it says they profess that they know god they have loud testimonies but in works they deny him we cannot defend those who are denying the Lord. How can you do that? Somebody is denying the Lord, your own Lord. The one who bought you, paid the price for you. And somebody is degrading, disgracing your own Lord. Are you going to defend somebody disgracing, degrading your Lord? You cannot do that. You cannot defend them. And then you cannot be writing to the headquarters. You know the truth. Sometimes our, our state overseers will discipline somebody. And then some of those, this is not, this is not a political arena. There's no politics here. Even if you feel that the state overseer did not do the right thing. Wouldn't you just have the understanding that, you know, that her father in the Lord in the state may know something we don't know? There may be a reason that we cannot discover. Wouldn't you give respect and honor to that state of us here? And we're not talking of people that, you know, just came to know the Lord. We're talking about people. Some of those state of us here have been here in deeper life for more than 30 years. And some of them had been state leaders, you know, in the 70s. And now we turned it, apart from state leader, they're now state overseers. And they have been state overseers and leaders for more than 25 years. Some of them, wouldn't you respect their experience, their unction, their anointing? And wouldn't you understand? And you know, sometimes when you write those letters, even the language in the letter, the language in the letter, Talking about your state of us here. This is a new year. We're going to stop all that. And then, you know, anonymous letters. Don't write anonymous letters. We just throw them in the waste paper basket. We don't, we don't even recognize that. We don't act on that. If you write anonymous letters, so-and-so is doing this, so-and-so is... Hey, don't try to... It's a waste of your time. Because we're not going to take any action on it. And even when you put your name, when you put your name, you mind your language, what you say about those leaders you know it, it's it's very costly to train people it's very costly to train somebody to the point of a state of a seer and to the point of a region of a seer now, that's why you'll find even in the world even in the world about this governor and you know that governor and that governor before they can take step you, you know what they do you read the papers you have to go through the senate and go through this and go through this it is not just because somebody makes an accusation to the president and says governor so and so is doing this the president cannot just go there the following day and remove that remove that governor it takes a process and except it's something that is that is really 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 out of the way how can you just remove somebody like that state of us here and so we need to understand the respect we need to have and the language we use and the attitude we have i'm sure that you know some of the state of us here they have children that as old as some of us who are leaders in the church, why don't you give them some respect? 
And when they do their duty and they do their work, and what I say for those state of affairs, I say for our own ministers and leaders here in Lagos. You want to understand that there is a work to do for them and for us and for me and for you as well. And we join hands together and this work, we're going to do it. I said, we're going to do it. And, and you know, when you do something like this, it, the, this church will be pure. This church will be powerful. This church will be mighty because now we're coming back and we're standing on this word. And as we stand on this word, even the devil will not know what to do with us. It'll just they leave those people alone and have a lot of other people. They can go and be climbing on their back. But over here this year, there's no victory for every one of us. And then it says, you know, these people, sometimes, uh, you know, our soul, how you went away from the Lord. And Samuel, bless his heart. Samuel, you know, Samuel was a great, a good man, a loving man, an affectionate man. And the Lord had rejected Saul. And God says, Samuel, I've rejected him. And then Samuel left all his work, everything he was to be doing, intercession for the whole nation, left all that, and it was morning and morning and morning. And God said, Samuel, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? Even if you cry from this time until the end of the decade, I told you I've rejected Saul. How long are you going to mourn for him? Get up and take the hand. And go to the house of Jesse. While you are mourning, I've been searching. I found a man there after my heart. And then he said, get up and go and anoint him. He'll be king. Then Samuel turned around and said, God, you know Saul. That man doesn't have any value for any life. Even though I'm the one that appointed him. That man, if he hears that I go to the house of Jesse, the condition in which he is, now he will kill me. God, what am I going to do about that? And so God said, all right. I understand what you're saying. I know what Saul can do. Just take the horn and go and make sacrifice. Don't uh, blow up the choosing of David, but just, just blow up the making of the sacrifice. And when they say, what have you come to do? Just say, I come to sacrifice to the Lord. See that. You know, some of us, we face danger, but the Lord will give us wisdom. I will still be able to go through in Jesus' name. What the Lord is telling us is that there is a fight to fight. You know, we're not fighting anybody. We're not fighting. It's a good fight of faith. Here is one song I'm reading to you before we pray. Fight the good fight of faith with all your might. Christ is your strength. Christ, your right. Lay hold on life. And it shall be your joy and your crown eternally. Run the straight race through God's good grace. Lift up your eyes and seek his face. Life with its way before thee lies. Christ is the path and Christ is your prize. Cast care aside. Lean on thy guide. His boundless mercy will provide lean and the trusting soul shall prove that Christ is its light and Christ its love. Faint not, fear not, his arms are near, he changes not and thou art dear, only believe and thou shalt thou see that Christ is all in all to thee. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord is calling us to this great work and he's telling us we need to maintain the standard and we need to silence the mouths of the people under our leadership who will not stand with us on the truth. And who will not hold to the truth along with us who want to destroy what we're developing. The Lord is challenging us and is saying we should handle the matter. Fight the good fight of faith. They hold on life eternal, eternal life. Stop the mouths of those people that are not preaching the truth under your leadership. 
That's your responsibility. That's your assignment. Do the work. Do the work. The Lord will help you. The Lord will sustain you. Commit yourself to the Lord. Don't care for honor, for reputation. Don't care for the speaking good of you or speaking evil of you. That doesn't matter. Just, just put your reputation in the hands of the Lord. They murmur, they gossip, and they complain, they backbite, they you know, call your names and do whatever. Ridicule you, disgrace you, despise you, belittle you, insult you, assault you. Don't you don't worry about that. Leave your honor, leave your glory, leave your reputation in the hands of the Lord. And you'll say, This is what you do, and do it. And your wives, uh, you know, for overseers, you'll hear a lot outside. You know, some of the people deliberately, your wives, they'll come to you and talk to you about the oversight, about your husband. They say they cannot reach you if whatever they tell your wife, you, eventually the husband will hear. When you get back home, just, just swallow that. Don't tell your husband anything that will make him weak. That will make him not to be able to stand. Don't go and tell your husband that, uh, daddy, this is what they are saying about you. Just, 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 just forget about it. Just forget about it. Don't tell your husband something that will weaken their hands. They will not be able to stand on the truth anymore. And some of you are children. You are already workers. We praise God for you. Some of them, some of these people will come to you and talk about daddy. You will talk about the overseer, your father. And they will say, you know, your daddy, this, this and this. They know that if they tell you that you are going to tell daddy at home, don't tell your father. Get some maturity. And have some stamina. Swallow that. Don't go back and tell your daddy and say, Daddy, you know, what the youths are saying about you. What, what, or what the members of the church are saying about you. Don't tell your father. That's one of the things to just control yourself. And say, Daddy will not hear this from me. Whatever they say. I will suffer with my father. I will suffer the persecution with my daddy. The state of Asia, the region of Asia, the leaders. Don't go back home and be telling them things that the people are saying. Give us a chance to do our work. Liberty to do our work. Whatever you tell your daddy, whatever you tell your husband, whatever you tell your wife, make them strong. Don't weaken the hands of people in the front line of the battle. In Jesus' name we pray. I need an amen of the conquerors. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight because of this word. You've given us everything. The whole Bible. And we stand by the whole Bible in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you'll give us the courage of Joshua. And the fortitude of David. And you give us, Lord, the spiritual stamina and the backbone of Paul the Apostle. That will be able to do this work in this generation in Jesus' name. That, Lord, you give us love, give us understanding, give us wisdom, give us insight, give us unction, give us power, give us anointing. Make us dynamite within us in Jesus' name. And they had to fulfill the great commission in the way it ought to be done. You grant to every one of your people, your servants and your ambassadors in Jesus' name. And Lord, in this area of choosing leaders and disqualifying some, also we pray you'll give us all the courage we need. All the conviction we need. All the spiritual stamina we need. And we will stand on the totality of the word of God. In Jesus name. Protect your servants. Preserve your servants. And where people have taken. The glory. The honor from them. Oh Lord you yourself from heaven. Give them the honor and the glory. That belongs to your servants. In Jesus name. And for all of us who are here, young and old, men and women, we join our hearts together. We'll make this church strong. 
will make this church stand in Jesus name and even when the operation of disqualification affects any of us will take it by your grace understanding that being disqualified today does not mean we're disqualified forever and we'll still have a right attitude a right disposition a right response to everything you allow you permit you lead you direct the leadership of our church to do in jesus name confirm your truth in every heart well thank you lord because we know you have answered in jesus name i'm so excited today because god has been so faithful to me i'm going to keep this very short first of all i want to thank god for the church the church has been my family um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the loan. I just thank God for all this. I just missed you. Great.